Welcome back now for the news in detail. As Pakistan commemorates 72 years of independence, its government officials have pledged to support Kashmiri's right to self-determination. Speaking in the Azad Jammu and Kashmir Assembly, Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan called New Delhi's move a strategic blunder. Meanwhile, Pakistan's military spokesperson tweeted that a piece of paper with no legal standing could not change the disputed territory's status. We have more in this report. Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan repeated his support for Kashmiri independence at the AJK Assembly. PM Khan said he will be Indian-occupied Kashmir's ambassador and raise the issue at every international forum. He said Islamabad has plausible information India is planning aggressive action in the valley. He compared the Bharatiya Janata Party's Hindu nationalism with Adolf Hitler's National Socialism. A horrifying ideology stands before us. This RSS ideology, which Narendra Modi has followed since childhood, was inspired by Adolf Hitler and Nazism. The RSS and BJP admire the Third Reich. They believe in Hindu racial superiority. They wish to take revenge from Muslims for ruling over them. Speaking at a flag-raising ceremony in Islamabad, Pakistan's President Arif Alvi accused New Delhi of planning a genocide in the occupied valley. He asserted Pakistan has always stood with Kashmir and will continue to do so. The atrocities of the Indian military, including extra-legal arrests and the use of pellet guns, is destroying the human rights of Kashmiris. The Pakistan military spokesperson tweeted that Pakistan does not recognize India's changing of occupied Kashmir's status as a disputed territory. He added the country's armed forces are prepared to perform their duties for the Kashmir cause. In a telephone conversation with Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, Pakistan's Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi said India violated international laws and UN resolutions by unilaterally revoking occupied Kashmir special status. Qureshi said Indian actions pose a threat to regional peace and security. Lavrov said Russia is closely observing developments and urged the two countries to resolve the issue through dialogue. Meanwhile, Pakistan summoned the Indian Deputy High Commissioner Gaurav Ahluvalia to condemn ceasefire violations by Indian forces along the line of control. Indian firing killed one civilian in the Hot Springs sector. The Foreign Office says the deliberate targeting of the civilian population is a violation of international law. Pakistan has asked the United Nations Security Council to convene an emergency meeting to discuss India's illegal annexation of occupied Kashmir. In a letter to the UNSC President Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi highlighted grave human rights violations in the occupied valley. Qureshi said India is planning a genocide of innocent Kashmiris. India is facing the condemnation across the world over its illegal annexation of occupied Kashmir and revocation of the territory's special states. Meanwhile, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation expressed concern over the curtailment of religious freedoms in Indian occupied Kashmir. It said stopping of Eid congregations by occupation forces is a violation of international human rights laws. The OIC also expressed concern over the circumstances being created due to long curfews, saying it had become difficult for patients to reach hospitals and people could not replenish fuel supplies. The OIC also called on the international community to resolve the Kashmir dispute in accordance with UNSC resolutions. It urged New Delhi to ensure the protection of Kashmiri Muslims' human rights. Moving on, Syrian government forces have taken control of five villages from rebels in northwestern Idli province. War monitors say regime forces are now four kilometers from the major rebel held town of Khan Sheikhun. Fighting between the two rival parties has intensified over the last few days. Earlier, government forces took control of six towns and several villages in northern Hama and south of Idli province.
Meanwhile, Russia says a summit for Astana process guarantees states, including Russia, Iran and Turkey, will be held next month. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov says the states will meet in Turkey to discuss the worsening crisis in Syria. This comes on the heels of a ministerial meeting of the bloc in Kazakhstan that opposed foreign intervention in the Syrian conflict. The summit was originally scheduled for the end of the year, but has been brought forward over the escalating violence in Idlib. The meeting will attempt to settle disagreements between Damascus and Ankara over the establishment of a safe zone in northern Syria. The Kremlin says the conference will discuss the security situation, transition processes, a constitutional commission and a resettlement in the country. Now, Egypt says Sudan's opposition parties have agreed to build a consensus over the constitutional declaration of civil military power sharing. The foreign ministry says the two-day meeting of all Sudanese opposition factions hosted by Cairo was a success. It says forces of freedom and change, including the Revolutionary Front, took part in the meeting. Cairo says participants will now consult their leadership in Khartoum on the outcome of the meeting. It says the conference was held to build consensus over the power-sharing agreement due to be signed on Saturday. Egypt says it will continue engaging with Sudan and neighboring countries for peace and stability. And Libya has told Egypt to stop interfering in its internal matters. This comes after Cairo issued a statement saying the House of Representatives is the only legitimate elected body in Libya. Libya's High Council of State says Cairo's statement is a violation of UN resolutions. It says all countries should recognize the UN-backed government of national accord as the only legitimate body. The HCS also rejected Egyptian statements on how Libya should spend its revenues. The Council has recommended firm action on the statement. Moving on, President Donald Trump has threatened to pull the U.S. out of the World Trade Organization if the body does not improve its conditions. Trump accused the organization of unfair treatment, asking it to stop designating China and other thriving economies as developing nations. Trump says Washington does not have to abide by WTO rulings and will leave the organization if necessary. It says the U.S. is disadvantaged as a member of the global bloc. Trump has directed the U.S. Trade Representative to secure changes in the group to prevent developing countries from using regulation loopholes. Under WTO rules, developing countries qualify for preferential treatment in trade agreements. Earlier highlighting China, Trump said dozens of countries abuse their status as developing countries. The United States has delayed the imposition of new trade tariffs on China until December. The two countries have also agreed to have another round of negotiations in two weeks. This follows the conversation between China's Vice Premier Liu He and U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer plus U.S. Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin. U.S. President Donald Trump says he made the decision after a very good phone call with China. He says he believes Beijing is ready to make a trade deal. Earlier this one, Trump said the U.S. would enforce an additional 10% tariff on the remaining Chinese goods from September 1st. Meanwhile, flight operations at Hong Kong airport have resumed amid warnings over ongoing protests. Last night, police and protesters clashed at the airport after flights were disrupted for a second day. A police officer was also injured in the clashes. Check encounters open to help the hundreds of weary travelers waiting overnight for flight. Ten weeks of increasingly violent clashes have plung the Asian financial hub into its worst crisis. Thousands of flights were cancelled in the past five days as protests became increasingly violent. Police have arrested 149 people accused of taking part in illegal assemblies and violence. Meanwhile, Afghanistan's President Ashraf Ghani has said the Taliban will recognize the legitimacy of the Kabul government on the first day of intra-Afghan talks. 
Speaking in Kabul, Ghani said a joint statement will be issued to establish legality of his government. Ghani said no new deals will be considered in the intra-Afghan negotiations. The Afghan president said Afghan national defense and security forces will not be compromised. The talks between the Taliban and Afghan government are expected to be held in a European capital within the next few weeks. The Taliban have repeatedly refused to be part of any intra-Afghan dialogue that recognizes the legitimacy of Ghani's government. More news coming up after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Now moving on with the news stories. Britain's Prime Minister Boris Johnson says some lawmakers are collaborating with the European Union to undermine Brexit talks. This comes after a senior lawmaker said they would seek to prevent any attempt to ignore Parliament over Brexit. Prime Minister Boris Johnson used a Facebook questionnaire and answer a session to attack critics of his Brexit plans. The Prime Minister said the EU must renegotiate the withdrawal agreement to avoid a no-deal Brexit. Our European friends and our European friends are not moving uh, in their opposition to, uh, in their willingness to compromise. They're not compromising at all on the withdrawal agreement, even though it's been thrown out three times. Meanwhile, German Chancellor Angela Merkel has said Berlin wants to maintain a close Britain-EU partnership after Brexit. Now, the UN Refugee Agency has asked European governments to urgently allow in rescued migrants who are now stranded in the Mediterranean Sea. More than 500 migrants are marooned at sea as countries argue over who should take them. UNHCR Special Envoy Vincent Cockertel says storms are coming and conditions are only going to get worse in the near future. The migrants are aboard two ships chartered by humanitarian aid groups. French charities SOS Mediterranean and MSF have rescued a total of 356 migrants on board the Ocean Viking vessel. Another 150 migrants have been aboard the Open Arms NGO ship for 12 days. The Italian government is refusing to let migrants land on its shores unless EU partners help take them in. Moving on, the death toll in rain-related incidents in India's southwest Kerala state has jumped from 60 to 92. This year's monsoon has wreaked havoc across South Asia, killing over 1,000 people since the start of July. Officials say 34 people have been injured and 61 others reported missing in various incidents in the region. India has been hit hardest by this year's monsoon, with over 750 people dying across the country. The Indian Met Department says the southwest monsoon is showing signs of intensifying over Kerala, sparking fears of more floods. Meanwhile, the rains have killed 113 people in Nepal, 97 in Bangladesh and 59 in Pakistan. Moving to Greece, we have fanned by strong winds. Wildfire has raised tracts of pine forests on the Evia island. The blaze led to villagers being evacuated following an appeal from the authorities for assistance from its European partners. A state of emergency was declared at the second largest Greek island of Evia. Over 227 firefighters along with six helicopters and six aircrafts were battling the blaze. The inferno is generating clouds of thick smoke that engulf the capital Athens. Croatia and Italy are expected to send help after an appeal was made for airborne firefighting equipment from Greek authorities. In Argentina, President Mauricio Macri has announced salary hikes and tax cuts to help ease the economy. The move comes after Macri's shock primary election defeat to his main leftist rival. President Macri says he will cut income taxes for workers and boost subsidies for social services after the two days of economic turmoil. He also announced the freezing of gasoline prices for 90 days as part of his plan to reduce the financial crisis impact. 
Macri said these measures will bring relief to 17 million workers and their families. The meltdown of Argentina's currency, stocks and bonds has sent shockwaves through emerging markets. Journeys into space aren't an easy ride. They take NASA years of calculations, design, precision and thousands of trials to find the right tools to launch and run the mission. To prepare for the next voyage to Mars in 2020, NASA has taken to Iceland's lava fields in preparation for the jobs. More in this report. With its black basalt sand, windswept dunes and craggy peaks, the Lambaron lava field at the foot of Iceland's second biggest glacier is ideal. For three weeks, 15 scientists and engineers sent by the US Space Agency descended on the site 62 miles from the capital Reykjavik last month. Experts say Iceland, a volcanic island middle of the North Atlantic, is in many ways reminiscent of the fourth planet, the Sun. It aims to continue the work of the Curiosity rover and search for signs of ancient life on the planet. Iceland is unique uh, for a couple reasons. The, the main reason that we come here is because of the mineralogy. The mineralogy in, in Iceland is very similar to what we would find on Mars. Using its sensors and camera, the rover gathers and classifies data from its environment and sends back the findings to the engineer's trailer. The speed needs to be slow to allow the rover to properly collect data and imagery. The engineers then package the data and send it to a tent, where scientists simulate how it would be sent from Mars to Earth. The rover exploring Iceland is a prototype. The real machine will be on Mars next year. Yeah, that's correct. We can uh, drive a lot faster here on Earth. Uh, I think right now we drive around 20 centimeters per second when we're driving remotely. For now, the engineers work with this device to collect all the data samples the real one will pick up on the red planet. The setting allows NASA to test equipment and procedures, as well as the people performing them in extreme environments while remaining firmly on terra firma. A 400-year-old temple in Kyoto, Japan, is attempting to hotwire interest in Buddhism with a robotic priest. Japan has developed a robot which can store knowledge of the present and the past in a bid to revolutionize Buddhism. We've seen technology drastically change the scope of our lives, but can we use it to harness how we view societal wisdom? The android canon, based on the Buddhist deity of mercy, preaches sermons at Koteji Temple in Kyoto. Its human colleagues say with artificial intelligence, it could one day acquire unlimited wisdom. With religion's influence on daily life flatlining in Japan, Goto hopes Koteji's robot priests will be able to reach younger generations in a new way. For over 2,000 years, Buddha has been depicted sitting, standing or lying down. But this has hardly changed over time. I thought this might be the time to have a Buddha which can speak and move. The adult-sized robot began service earlier this year and is able to move its torso, arms and head. Pious Droid delivers sermons from the Heart Sutras in Japanese with translations in English and Chinese projected onto a screen for foreign visitors. A recent Osaka University survey showed a wide range of responses with many expressing surprise at how human it looked. The fundamental difference is that us, the monks, we will die one day. This robot will never die. It will just keep updating itself and evolving. This is all its, its charm. This robot has been developed at the cost of almost $1 million, a joint venture by the Zen Temple and the Robotics Department of Osaka University. The priests believe Mindar can help people overcome pain, but expect that its contribution will go a long way. In the future, I hope that Mindar will assimilate even more data and evolve to become a master capable of listening and solving everyone's questions. Mindar is here as a modern spin on tradition to address the problems of contemporary life. It is 75 years since the liberation of Paris from the Nazis and the city likes to think its first liberators were French. 
In fact, the very first were Spanish Republican soldiers who survived the Spanish Civil War of the 1930s. A new painting unveiled in Paris tells their story. This fresco marks the moment when the first soldiers became the first to enter German-occupied Paris, arriving through the Italy Gate. It is 75 years since Paris was liberated from its Nazi oppressors over the 24th, 25th, and 26th of August 1944. Contrary to popular belief, the first liberators into the city weren't French or American, but Spanish. These paintings tell their story. Strangely enough, when the Parisians see all these half-tracks coming, they think at first it's the Americans. So they say, yes, we were liberated by the Americans. And then in fact, they realize that they were foreigners who could not speak French and they were Spanish. They realize that they were Spanish. The 140 men of the Neuve, or the 9th Company of the Chad Regiment of the Free French Army, landed with the Allies on D-Day. By the war's end, there were very few left. Many were killed in battles for Hitler's residence in Germany. After the liberation of Paris, they left for Bergstaden. They stayed there for about two weeks and they left for the Eagle's Nest. And that's where there was a fairly large massacre, since only 16 of them came down. They were shot by by the Hitler youth who were waiting for them up there. This fresco commemorates him and all his friends who risked their lives and didn't make it. In the postmodern world, chivalrous behavior is fast becoming an endangered virtue. The flag bearers of aristocracy, the Britons, however, have found a way to keep their borderline eccentrics alive. The annual Chap Olympiad in southern England has found a unique way to celebrate gentlemanly conduct. More with this report. It was dapper suits, vintage frocks and cucumber sandwiches all round at the Chap Olympiad, a contest with a very British twist. The extravagant event saw competitors trying to outdo each other in unconventional ways. The festival includes competitions like picnic vaulting, where contestants use walking sticks to vault over a couple taking a picnic. Challengers also try to beat each other by not spilling tea while riding a bicycle. The organizers say the idea behind the event is to test gentlemanly skills. Umbrella jousting is our key event and it really it really sort of tests the skills of a gentleman in holding a furled umbrella and a briefcase while riding a bicycle and being charged at by another chap on a bicycle with the same uh, equipment. So it's really quite difficult and it's all about coordination and handling of the gentlemanly skills and there's not really much sporting involved. I mean it's we really we really avoid any sporting tests. It's we're testing gentlemanly skills. Will this make a difference? It looks like it might. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the chair is... People taking part say the carnival helps them escape their daily mechanical routine. Absolute buffoonery and silliness and fun and, and uh, it's the British at their best, I think, you know, and it's, it's to be able to be lighthearted and not take things too seriously and that's what I like about it. That's what draws me to it as well and the characters and the games. I think it's fantastic. This year, the Chap Olympiad was postponed for a day due to extremely British windy conditions. A drink made from date palms is highly sought after Indonesia, especially during the hot summer months. Tunisians say the drink is a part of their identity. This report has more. Palm trees matter the most for Tunisians after God. A popular drink of choice among them is the date palm drink or legmi, but the delta drink is not easy to extract. Choosing the palm tree before making the cut, it is necessary to choose a big and mature palm tree for good legmi to drink and a good amount of juice. To extract the juice, Musa climbs the palms barefoot. He carefully cuts the bark to cause a reaction from the palm that makes its sap rise. To keep it fresh, he places bottles of ice in the can that the sap flows into overnight. Then the juice is immediately frozen until it's poured for sale. In the summer, Legmai has its own specifications 
and not everyone can make it. In summer, it is fragile because of the heat. The temperature is very, very high. It is fragile, so it cannot sit in the heat because it rots and becomes vinegar. Locals fear pollution from factories are threatening the palm trees. State-owned Tunisian Chemical Group has been processing phosphate in the area since the 1970s and has been blamed for putting the oasis at risk. More news to follow after a short break. Stay tuned. Wall Street stocks have plunged due to increased fears of a global recession. Bank stocks have declined as Bank of America and Citigroup shares fell 2.8 and 3.4 percent, respectively. The indices of JP Morgan have also dropped 3 percent. Dow Jones Industrial Average slipped about 420 points. The S&P 500 index slumped 1.5 percent, while the Nasdaq Composite declined 1.7 percent. Meanwhile, gold prices have also soared 1%. European stocks have fallen after a positive start as Germany's economy went into reverse, reviving fears of global recession. Europe's biggest economy released numbers showing a fractional shrinking in the second quarter because of the Sino-US trade war. The Euro stock 600, London's FTSE and France's CAC all dipped. Wall Street futures gauges were also slipped marginally. Asian stocks ticked up after Washington delayed tariffs on some Chinese imports. Japan's Nikkei gained over 1%, while South Korea's Kospi rose 0.7%. The Shanghai Composite Index advanced over half a percent. Hong Kong's Hang Seng, despite disruptions from large anti government protests, rose half a percent. New Zealand scored 203 for 5 at Sums on day 1 of the first test against Sri Lanka in Gale. Ross Taylor kept the host in the fight after Sri Lanka's Akila Dhananjaya and took 5 wickets. New Zealand won the toss and elected to bat first. Sri Lankan spinner Akila Dhananjaya claimed 5 wickets to put the visitors on the defensive. Ross Taylor made a 100-run partnership with Henry Nichols to stabilize New Zealand's innings. Taylor remained not out on 86 at stumps on day one. Play was called off shortly after tea due to heavy rain, meaning 22 overs were lost. The International Weightlifting Federation has provisionally suspended five Russian weightlifters over alleged doping violations. The athletes' drug tests were conducted by the World Anti-Doping Agency at a number of different competitions. A 2012 Olympic bronze medalist, 2013 women's world champion are among the five suspended athletes. IWF said it regrets additional cases of doping in the sport from some years. Now at Cincinnati Masters in the United States, Swiss legend Roger Federer and world number one Novak Djokovic have reached the round of 16. Each player secured straight sets victory. Third seed Federer East past Argentina Juan Ignacio Lodero, winning 6-3 and 6-4. The Swiss maestro won 83% of his second serve points and wrapped up the victory in 61 minutes. Federer is pursuing his 29th ATP Masters 1000 title. Earlier, the defending champion and top seed Djokovic defeated America's Sam Querrey 7-5 and 6-1. The Serb served up his 15th service ace on match point to make up for his slow start in the hard court. The win makes Djokovic the first to advance to the third round. Meanwhile, Swiss Dan Borinka edged Bulgaria's Grigor Dimitrov 5-7, 6-4 and 7-6 in a roller coaster first round match.
Premier League champions Manchester City have avoided a transfer ban after admitting to breaching FIFA rules on signing youth players. The club was fined £315,000 for breaking regulations. The football governing body says City broke Article 19 by signing players under the age of 18. The club claims the breaches were a result of a misinterpretation of regulations. City faces a separate investigation from UEFA regarding financial fair play. Earlier, another English club, Chelsea, was given a one-year transfer ban after breaking the rules on international transfers. French football club Marseille has sacked World Cup winner Adil Rami reportedly for gross misconduct following a disciplinary procedure. Adil Rami's contract was terminated after he skipped training to take part in a TV reality show. The defender said he was injured but on the same day took part in the recording of a French TV show that included physical stunt. The defender had been under investigation since he missed the session at the end of the last season. In July, club president Jax Henry Arroud told Rami he needed to think deeply about his obligations as a player and especially as a world champion. Stephanie Rappard is set to become the first female referee to officiate in the UEFA Super Cup. The French referee says she is not afraid of the intense pressure. Rappard will be assisted by two other female referees in the UEFA Super Cup final between Liverpool and Chelsea in Istanbul. The 35-year-old says she will prove female officials are as competent as their male counterparts. I think it's the same. We had to prove us physically, technically and tactically that we have the same that the men. So I'm not afraid about that. So I think nothing. Now let's have a look at the weather updates across the world. With the weather update, we come to the end of this bulletin. For more news and updates, stay tuned with Indus News.